Okay, I think we can start. Um, herzlich willkommen zu unserer um, heutigen online Veranstaltung. Welcome to our today's An online meeting. Anlässlich on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the U.S. Resolution 1325 uh, passing, uh, Women, Peace and Security. Quite early, you have seen a couple of um, images and pictures uh, right now, and these are a teaser for a collection of portraits um, of women from 20 different countries um, that are working towards peace and security. And we collected all of these portraits and are very happy to launch a web dossier today, as like in this second actually. Um, which is available for the moment in English and German and will be available in French and Spanish um, very shortly during the next uh, one or two days. Um, the women represented in this dossier are politicians, soldiers, police women, activists, academics, journalists, and many, many more. Um, and I can tell you, I can assure you, <laughs> They, they and their stories and their achievements are all equally really impressive and great. And I'm so happy and honored that uh, we have this, um, that we conducted this project. Um, we are also very happy to be part of a, trip, a Twitter campaign, which Hannah Neumann initiated. Um, and Hannah is also one of our panelists. You're gonna, if you don't know her yet now, you're gonna know uh, later on. Um, the campaign is called hashtag security and um, invites everyone to share um, his or her story about a woman that is engaged in peace and security um, with and this woman inspire who which women inspire you when it comes to these topics. And I think it's a very nice campaign and if you want to um, also tweet on um, women that are inspiring to you, then please feel free to also use this hashtag. Um, before I now hand over to Barbara Unmusik, the president of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, uh, I want to give you some technical information. Most of you uh, might already um, realize that this event is um, held in English and German. And you can choose whichever language you want to hear in the um, lower bar of your Zoom screen. There's a little globe, you can click on it, and then you can choose the language you want to hear. Um, also, I want to inform you that this, the, the event is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on our YouTube channel after the, yeah, right after the event. Um, and both languages are going to be recorded. And then also, um, if you want to raise questions, and we really welcome you to do so, um, and invite you to do so, um, please do it via the um, Q&A. You also find it in the lower bar of your screen. And then uh, one of my colleagues is going to collect these questions, and we're going to discuss them later on. And now, with no further ado, I want to hand over to Barbara. Thank you for introducing for taking over the introduction today. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you and please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna Schwarz and the Brussels office to, to hold this uh, great event today. I'm, gonna to I, I'm, I'm going to speak in German from now on. Sorry for that. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is wonderful and very nice that you were able to join us for this online event of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung on the occasion of the 20th anniversary on the adoption of the resolution 1325. And my welcome is particularly addressed to our panelists. I'm particularly looking forward to the discussion. And please allow me, I would particularly um, welcome um, Mahushka, who is discussing with us. Um, Mahushka um, is very well known to the Heinrich Böll uh, Stiftung. She has got uh, a, um, a prize from the uh, Foundation for all the initiatives uh, which are devoted uh, to the security and peace of uh, women and girls and of uh, dealing with conflicts. 
the Heinrich Böll Foundation and particularly the um, and also the Institute for uh, Gender Equality um, is dealing with the resolution, which has been passed uh, 20 years ago. From the beginning, it was supported. And I myself, I have been dealing with this uh, resolution since a long time. And with many uh, people who have accompanied, I have done everything I could for this um, UN resolution has made known because it was unknown. And I think I may say with some pride that um, it was also quite a share of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung that this resolution has not only uh, been known um, in the um, Bundesrepublik, but also that it has found a huge network of partners worldwide. And wherever we find people who join us, we make this resolution known and we show that it is binding for governments to include women in all phases of conflicts. And what we need, and all know this who are participating in this conference, we need enormous amount of pressure for this um, resolution to be filled with life. Therefore, it is excellent that uh, we really uh, start with this online event and at the same time, we should really also uh, point to what should be done in the future in uh, conflicts and that uh, crises are not only prevented, but when they have taken place, um, punishments can be uh, taken. We have to do everything that uh, gender specific causes of these conflicts um, become a part and parcel of any conflict dealing and women should be listened to in all the phases of the conflicts. When the UN resolution exactly on the um, 31st October 2000 was passed, was adopted, it was a milestone. It was really a breakthrough of um, untiring lobbying work by many, many committed ladies who were really doing something for conflict prevention. Finally, and this is absolutely important right to the present day, women should be included in foreign and um, not only as an addition and uh, somewhere on the sideline, but they should be fully um, participating. I find it wonderful that uh, the portraits, which we have just seen online, that we have 20 women in our online portrait and they are representatives of the many women on, from regions all over the world who are really doing something for the um, protection of women and girls. And I would really like to thank Hannah Neumann, the European deputy and Hannah Schwarz from the Heinrich Böllstoffu in Brussels and uh, Diana Bossier uh, from, from the Foundation in Zaria for the beautiful initiative and for their excellent implementation. We do need faces. We have to make women visible. That is a claim of the Heinrich Böllstoffu, not only for this event, but also for the future. 10 years ago, after the first decade of the resolution, I was at a similar event where together we have drawn up a balance what, uh, what has been achieved so far after 10 years of passing. This was beyond the um, palpable fight of the women and it was really a depressive um, event. Ten years ago, it was only 24 of altogether 192 UN members who had really initiated national um, implementation plans. Ten years ago, the Federal Republic of Germany was not present there yet. And we have really needed a lot of efforts to bring the federal government um, here in our country to tackle an action plan and also consult women what this plan should be like. In the last decade, in the last 10 years, 
uh, the constant pressure uh, on the government has achieved something. And the, uh, the UN um, 1325 was accompanied by other resolutions who have also dealt with topics of uh, sex and violence and have always um, concentrated on the implementation of the resolution 1325. So with new resolutions, we have always have um, uh, took reference to the uh, basic um, resolution in this respect, uh, 1325. And meanwhile, many governments, namely 82, particularly in the European Union, are now uh, really setting up uh, um, national plans to implement the resolution. And Sweden in 2014, with their concept for a feminist um, foreign and security policy, has really given an, a new start. And it was then followed by France, Canada, and other something uh, to really find or set up a feminine um, foreign security policy. The German federal government is um, is going to really also get committed and want to present its third national plan in the next year at the occasion of an anniversary. They had promised um, a draft to us, which was going to be commented, but unfortunately the draft is not uh, available to us. But we do hope that the uh, that the promise that we this this can be implemented, and that all the ideas can be integrated and be implemented. In Colombia, the peace con a treaty between the government and the rebels is comprising uh, more than 100 measures uh, taking care of the uh, gender um, aspect and also the participation of women. This was also a, a result of the effective work of uh, Colombian women's organization and they represent one of the first examples of an international peace process. And the resolution 1325 to the um, Colombian women was a very um, important reference. But Colombia is also an example that uh, women's organization, which are cooperating with the um, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, um, they report to us how little they were able to achieve. Uh, toward. And this is decisive. They do not have any resources to really keep this peace process uh, uh, going in Colombia. I'll come back to that. And on the Philippines, and this is also one of the progresses where the peace um, negotiations between the government and the Mora rebels have uh, really been led by the first uh, chief um, female negotiator have uh, gone on and since the 12th of September 2020 there's an inner Afghan dialogue in Doha and for the first time after 19 years there are peace negotiations the Taliban are speaking to um, a delegation of the Afghan government where four women are also present and I would only give you these examples as a sign that by and by we were able to uh, achieve that um, women are not only perceived as victims and they show that the political will to include uh, women is very much appreciated but at the same time we see that what I have shown as positive um, examples are still the exceptions Today, 20 years after the passing of the UN resolution, uh, resolution we have to find that um, not enough uh, women are participating regarding conflict solution and peace. Not even 10% of the negotiators at negotiating tables are women. And this is a clear figure which really um, makes it clear to us how far we are still away from the implementation of the resolution. It is threatening that uh, women activists worldwide 
um, have to really fight hard when they go for prevention and peace. In Colombia and Afghanistan, women are seeing personal threats. There are um, violations and there are also murders of women. And these women have to be taken into consideration. We have to remember that they really have paid a high price uh, regarding a peace for women and girls. And the UN Resolution 1325 is binding uh, in the framework of people's right. There are obligations for the states, but there are no sanctions if the governments are not taking care of the resolution. And in addition, and that you all know, there are concrete, uh, there are no concrete uh, uh, timings. There are no quota regulations and no mechanisms how the negotiations for peace are going to be um, uh, controlled in the future. And that you also know, it is not sufficient to formally make women participate in peace negotiations. What we need is much more concrete agreements and also concrete projects. Their mechanisms are needed, which have to be institutionalized. And then what we also need is financial and personal resources for women to really allow them to do their job. And um, this is still a very, very difficult regarding conflict work and post-conflict work. And this has to be achieved in the future. I'm fully convinced of it, that more than ever before, uh, we have to play a much more, uh, we need a much more active role of the uh, um, European Union and their member states, because otherwise the resolution 1325 is not going to be implemented. We need pioneers and examples who really lead the way in prevention and also do something against uh, sexual violence and to really take it serious with particip making women participate in all the conflicts. And loud and clear, do we have to bring back into conscience no women, no peace. And in this sense, I wish all of us an exciting discussion we need a solidarity amongst each other. We need strong networks who make it quite clear that when we stand together, we can reach something, but the way is still pretty far. And this meeting here, this online talk, is one of the many, many items in the big, big network which we have to set up. So uh, a big, big thank you to Brussels again, and I'm looking forward to to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It is now my great pleasure and honor um, to welcome our today's distinguished um, panel. And I can assure you, it's really my my it's really my personal honor <laughs> that I'm allowed to um, introduce these women. So first of all. Um, I want to introduce to you Claire Hutchinson, um, who is uh, the NATO Secretary General Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security since 2018. She is the high level focal point on all aspects of NATO's contribution to the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And um, previously, she already worked as a senior agenda ad um, advisor with the United Nations. Um, where she was involved in setting the strategic development of women, peace and security for the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping in New York, Kosovo and Lebanon. A very warm welcome to you, Claire. Then we have Numa Rusia Bonasse, who was already mentioned by Barbara. Numa Rusia is the national coordinator at Kulumani, that you all took the time to join this um, debate today and I think Barbara already touched upon uh, several changes that has been have been made during the last 20 years um, but I would also be very interested in hearing from all of you which changes you could see in your work in your activism and um, yeah just in in your professional and activist surrounding 
And um, I would really like to hear Mozen first, actually. <laughs> so if you could uh, give us a little insight. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank, I really thank you for this event and being with those wonderful women who are not only passionate, but also active and they are doing things for the cause because this is one of the most important things why we are living in this not stable world that seeing those women and feminists who are active and they are trying to do something for our cause. Honestly, 20 years of 1325 being part of being a feminist from this region is something so important and when I received this invitation I was thinking about not only 1325 but also the question and the discussion of peace and security and women in the last 20 years in the world and also in my region which is the Middle East and North Africa region and also all the time I'm saying that I'm a proud feminist uh, I'm, and also I'm so proud to be part of this movement worldwide and in our region and this is what I wanted to focus on while we are thinking in the last 20 years. I think the feminist movement in the last 20 years all over the world and in our region has presented to the world different things, not, uh, not only uh, by not only the the knowledge but also by practices because people have been seeing the question of war and peace as patriarchal people have been presenting to us what's war what's conflict and also what's peace and what's our role as women or feminists in this process but the feminist movement gave us something so different they gave us the tools and the values of this movement worldwide. They gave it to the process and also they gave it by those wonderful and amazing feminists who have been engaged in this process. They gave us this thing about what does it mean to listen and understand everyone's problems and what they have been facing out of conflict, war, and violence. They gave us this understanding and recognition of what we have been facing as people, especially as women and women's bodies. So we are not blaming the victims or the survivors. We are thinking about them and give them voices. The feminist movement gave us this solidarity approach by practices and by things has been done through this process and at the same time this movement gave us this process of healing for all the societies and communities who have been facing violence this collective healing not only for people who have been facing violence but also normalizing it and sometimes they justify it. But with the inclusion of the feminist values and movement and feminists inside these processes, things has been better. And honestly, they have been giving this message that we can do it better than others. We can be active of these changes, not only tools for the hands of those patriarchal people to to exist as a checklist. And this is something has been in this process in the last 20 years and in the last 10 years in my region, this has been so clear and implemented. We have been seeing how women in Egypt and feminist movement in Egypt has been focusing and tackling sexual violence. We have been seeing Lebanese women we have been seeing how the amazing processes of Yemeni women and Libyan women, the Gulf women and other women who are facing traditional wars, but also societal violence and also securitized and militarized uh, government, how they have been with their values.
as feminists and their existence not only being tool but actors for this change they just need the solidarity all over the world Thank you very much, Mozen. That was very, uh, was, was very already very good start. Now, Claire, um, you have been working on the implementation of this resolution since many years, and also in in two different multilateral organizations. So, I would be very interested in um, in your thoughts and insights on on what has been changed, what what was changed since 20 years. Great, thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, and hello to my fellow sisters. I, uh, I'm delighted I can be among you. You know, I, I really do believe. I feel like I've been working in this agenda since I was born. Um, but I, I stand on the shoulders of phenomenal women, and uh, and they are everywhere, and they fight for women's rights in the places that are hardest and most difficult. So I say on this 20th anniversary. Uh, one thing that has changed most dramatically is having human rights defenders, women human rights defenders and women civil society at the front and center of something like security and defense. Um, 20 years ago, I was, I was actually doing my academic work on women, peace and security before it was women, peace and security. Uh, and I have uh, worked in this environment for a very long time. And what's changed is something as simple as uh, having the word feminism in, in NATO, that we have uh, a, a secretary general who is a feminist to say that I am a very, I am a devout feminist, but that we're putting feminism into the conversation around defense and security, which didn't happen 20 years ago. We, we, are, we are unpacking and deconstructing words like patriarchal systems in terms of how does that and how does it connect with militarization. And all of these conversations didn't have any home 20 years ago. In fact, 20 years ago, I can remember working on women, peace and security and doing a training in the first mission I was deployed, which was in Unmik in Kosovo. And I can remember having conversations with people who were telling me, we'll deal with the real issues first and then we'll deal with your issue. Um, and being arch because it's not an issue. This is about how we change the trajectory of, of life and security and defense and protection and that it can't be on the periphery. It has to be at the center of everything we do. And over the years, it has changed so much. We have changed in terms of we have 10 resolutions now and I would like to say that I think as the resolutions have got uh, adopted through the years, the mandate has got stronger. It has broadened out to become an all-encompassing security mandate that takes in the voices of both feminists who don't necessarily see that uh, having a military is a necessarily a good idea, to having those like myself who work in NATO who believe that this is the future. And what I, I really welcome is that we now have a chance to have these conversations where we may not agree with each other, but where our commonality is gender equality and the future and the empowerment of women in any place, in any part of the world, and especially the conversation where women are most at risk. And so we now have an architecture of, of resolutions. We have policies. Uh, NATO got its first policy in 2007, we updated it in 2018, and we introduced our own principles, uh, because it has to be, I believe, women, peace and security has to be contextualized to each organization, to each, be it uh, an organization that's an NGO, to an individual, but we have to take the principles and make them into something that works for us. And again, that has changed over the years. And so for NATO, we have three principles which are building on women, peace and security, which is integration, inclusiveness and integrity. And over the years, we have seen commitments from nations that was just mentioned, the adoptive national action plans. And I'll say a big plug to NATO. We, you know, one of our allies was the first to have a national action plan, Denmark, um, to one of the most recent Latvia. So we are part of this, uh, this movement too. 
Um, and so we've seen national action plans grow. We've seen different organizations get into play the, the formation of, of policy and a normative uh, connection to this agenda. Um, we've seen the amount of conversations on women, peace and security change. We've seen the engagement of men in this agenda. And we've seen the growth of sexual violence as a tactic of war. And that it's not just a natural outcome of a conflict, but that it is a serious and strategic way of uh, demoralizing community, but destroying women's bodies as well as, as girls, men and boys. But what we haven't seen over the last 20 years is often a change in the amount of resources or the amount of attention and the time frame that gets to have this conversation on women, peace and security. And so while there has been a rise all our organizations have gender advisors. We all have a conversation. Just last week, uh, we had women, peace and security in our defense minister's conversation, uh, which is incredible, incredible uh, growth. And where we talked about the connection and importance of defense and uh, women, peace and security. But as we move forward, we're going to have to make sure that this isn't just an anniversary issue, anniversary conversation or anniversary women, peace and security. And that has been one of the problems that I have seen over the years that has not changed. Because the peaks and troughs, the interest and in round resolution uh, implementation happens on every anniversary. It's like someone coming, giving you a present on your anniversary and forgetting about you the, the rest of the year. Um, it's, we have to make sure we're committed to this as we move forward. And we have to make sure that as we, as we advance this agenda, as we get more traction with the agenda, that we have to be putting in the conversation that links between military and civilian, that links between civil society and, and those in institutions, that links between men and women, so that we're all on the same page. There's been a lot of changes over 20 years, but I refuse to celebrate because we haven't done enough. And I don't believe that asking for another 20 years is going to be okay, that we need to see change happening now, because this is the time that we have to push hard and we need more boldness in the agenda and more boldness in pushing this forward. Because while it's no longer on the periphery, it still isn't at the center. And only at the center will women, peace and security have traction so that we do find gender equality uh, for all. Thank you very much for this already very strong also policy recommendation. <laughs> um, but now jumping from the multilateral to the grassroots level, I would also like to ask Numa Usia, which changes you um, could observe during the last 20 years of your work. Um, yeah, please. Um, Numa Russia, you are still muted. I think you need to switch on your microphone. It's okay? Now, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm just greeting you all with honor. Uh, of bringing us to be part of this uh, good and a uh, high level, I can say a high level uh, event, talking about the United Nations uh, security uh, resolution is something which is bigger than us at the grassroots level. But we appreciate because now you are doing exactly to connect uh, the grassroots level with the higher levels is what we are appreciating and it is a good thing which when I received this inv invitation uh, my group from Kuluman support group the members and the neighborhood say oh now this is the time that uh, there's some people who are having open ears and listen and look down and see that there are people who needed to be part of the resolutions, to be part of uh, putting some efforts to 
this panda, pandemic, I can say it's a pandemic of the, the issue of not having justice, not having safety, not having security, and also uh, not uh, being like uh, ignored as women. I am talking from the experience of knowing how uh, we are coming from the issue of being oppressed by the apartheid uh, regime, which uh, we fought as women we were part and parcel and came with the strategies which uh, was leading to uh, give the liberation to democracy. Uh, what I can say with the issue of uh, the changes is that uh, we managed from that uh, perspective of fighting uh, apartheid and went to democracy, which we, we, we said is a, we are liberated, thinking that. But uh, with the issue of democracy, we find that it's, it was still a, a long walk to go. Uh, looking at all the policies and the, the, uh, the constitution and the bills of rights which were put in place, we said, oh, things are happening. Oh, thank you. It seems as we are going somewhere. There were TRC commissions which were put in place in order uh, women can voice out, can, be, can participate. But it was through the forceful and the push of the women to be part of those commissions because we were not uh, uh, called for. What we've, we also experienced is that uh, during the time of the TRC, uh, women issues were not put in, 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 into place and into uh, focus by uh, the commission and by the, those leaders who created TRC. But we, we put forward and we tried to, say, especially the issue of sexual harassment and uh, the, uh, the gender uh, issues of rape and all this, it was totally not been put. We said through the life commitment of the women, because we do manage to organize women and we managed to unite women and we managed to make them to be uh, to know they are human rights which makes them to be an active a group which started to break the silence started to fight for their human rights fight for peace security and safety and they say that uh, this uh, can happen through the issues of starting with the basis of uh, rehabilitation, the issues of re reparation, the issues of fighting for equality, equal social, uh, economic, political, cultural justice. Peace can happen if all those bases can be started with and looked at in all levels of society. Uh, if this cannot happen, the problem is going to carry on, continue the issue of injustice and the issue of uh, building peace. It will be like we are cracking the, the walls. So, uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, South Africa uh, uh, being part of the this uh, resolution, this United Nation uh, 1325 uh, security, they did not come down. The only issue, which uh, as I, I started by saying thank you for calling us here, uh, uh, is the first time that we look at this uh, resolution as a group, as an organization down there to say that, what can we do? Let's talk about it. Let's see that how this uh, resolution can be implemented, how this resolution can be uh, take, can be took forward. So 
it's a great honor. And uh, uh, what I can say, we need to put efforts. We need to involve all levels of society uh, to connect the so-called uh, professionalism with the issue of the so-called a grass or root level to us it's like uh, there are two uh, universities there is no non-professionalism and professionalism we are talking about the human rights here we are talking about the women the women of all societies which are suffering uh, South Africa people know that it's a, a democratic country with all policies, Bill of Rights, Constitution, which is good. And they went through to the TRC. They did all according to the documentation. But when it comes to the issue of implementing and doing the right thing for the women, we are struggling as women. We have taken up into our hands and we rolled again our dresses or skates or whatever we call it, which we put on. We are back to what we have done during the apartheid to say, hey, well, let's now stand up and be part and bring peace and do bring change and make sure that we do transformation. And this must start at home. And also we can also help the other uh, countries and other organizations. But if we know what we are doing, what we have tried and we have achieved, that's what we are uh, looking at and what we are doing at the present, with this issue, we have created a, a, a Gopal Mamas Forum within Kuluman Support Group, uh, whereby those, the, those group is, is, is his mother and a grandmother's forum, according to English, uh, where we said that we need to think well. We need to look back and create platform, participate and deal, uh, do thoroughly discussions of looking at what is that we have to do as women in order to bring change, in order to be bring peace, in order to secure security and bring safe, to be in a safe zone as women in our society. And also, we're sorry, we did also have a men's forum. We, 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 need, we, we said we need to bring both uh, this, the men which are patriotic, they must understand, they must be part and listen to the, to the views and to the call of the women in order they can change their direction towards being aggressive, towards being the, the, the bosses of the world. We don't want to see the bosses of the world and we like also the international uh, to help us with the resources, because we are committed, we have taken a life committed to create platforms from uh, all levels of society. We can do it, uh, we are capable. I'm not afraid to say that. Nima let Gusia, uh, let me invite Hannah to the conversation <laughs> because um, she is, um, she is the other level you were talking about, like she's working on this other level. And um, she was also um, during her campaign for the youth empowerment, she was also um, campaigning to work on these topics and is already working on it since more than a year now. So Hannah, what change did you observe during the last 20 years might be a little much, but since you started working on the topic, which is already many years ago as well. Thank you, Anna. And um, I have to say, I'm very glad to be part of this panel and to see this um, No Women, No Peace dossier happening because as Claire said, and I had it written in my book as well, we are standing on the shoulders of so many brave women. And Although maybe, I mean, 20 years ago, I was 16, but 15 years ago, I started working in foreign and security policy. And it was a man's world back then. And I would say it's still a man's world today. 
But what has changed, and this makes my life a lot easier than the life of those that have fought for Resolution 1325, is that at least in rhetoric, if I say, well, I mean, look how many women are on this panel and how many men there are, I do no longer need to justify why I'm asking this question. Okay, I still get a long list of excuses why this is the case, but still it, it makes my life a lot easier that there seems to be in rhetoric at least a common sense around the issues enshrined in Resolution 1325, at least I would say on European Union and to, to a large extent NATO level, although on the margins of NATO things seems to be changing at the moment, but that is maybe for another conversation. Um, so, so, so this means that I, I, we don't have to fight so much at the moment for the recognition of the concept and the ideas. And there are strategies and resolutions and action plans. So there's the knowledge on how to get there. And I think, especially this concept of rights, resources, and representation that um, was produced by the Swedish helps also me to explain to others what it's all about, this idea of a feminist foreign policy of implementing Resolution 1325. But if I look at how good we are in translating this into our actually practice, of foreign and security policy, there's a long way to go. And I really think that is maybe the challenge for the next 20 years to translate all these concepts and these um, visions into really changing how we do foreign and security policy. And um, I, I have to say, I'm not as optimistic as Claire. I still have the feeling that this foreign, this gender equality thing is still seen as an add-on. So basically, it's, I still have this impression, now, even now with the COVID crisis, so we actually know that it has such a deep gender dimension. It's still like, let's deal with that one first and then come, please come with your gender equality stuff. And I really think that is maybe the first step for us at the moment is not to have people understand that we need gender equality, but to help them understand it's, it's one of the core issues if we want to change, for example, from war to peace. It's one of the core issues to bring women on the table and not something nice once we solve like the big weapon stuff. Um, and, and your second question was, Anna, I think prior to this panel, how, how do we get there? And, and I want to make a few remarks on that one as well, maybe also to start the discussion. I think one aspect is to give visibility to the many women on the many different levels who do this work. Also because it helps others to identify. Because when I started in working in this field, I, I didn't have a role model or I didn't know whom to look up to. So I just felt a bit alienated and, and had to claim my own spot. And that, that is very tiring. And, and I think just letting other, especially girls know that there is a place for you and that there's a way to go. And, and there are women who really rock it and you can turn to and you can talk to them and you can address them is something wonderful and also going through, through these dossiers that, that now with the help of the Heinrich Bolt Foundation found, found their way to light is something very inspiring because I can connect with them and, and it makes me richer and it makes um, this whole dimension of foreign security policy, which is still a male field, much more female, but we shouldn't stop there. And that's good why we're having this discussion because I think we also need to talk about the structural problems that even 20 years down the road still make sure that women have do not have the same representation, do not have the same resources, do not have the same rights as men. Um, and here, um, I think it's important that, and that, that was, I think, very nicely put by Norma Rocha Bonasse, that um, we look at our own institutions that we start at home. So it's one thing to say, but the Turkish should, or why don't the South Africans? But it's another one to actually look at our own institutions and how they work and how they not work and how representation is there. And that's what, for example, I tried to do with the report on gender equality in the use foreign and security policy to say, well, I mean, we have 17 CSDP missions, so like peacekeeping missions. And since a month now, one is headed by a woman. Before that, none was headed by a woman. How can we go there and preach about gender equality if we don't even manage in our own institutions? And you can run the whole line. And Claire has put these three eyes that you have in NATO already. And I was just trying to think what would I want it to be for the EU based on the work I did in last year. And I think I would borrow the representation and the resources from the Swedish. So it's to make sure that we have women on the negotiation tables as ambassadors. 
why don't we have half of the EU ambassadors being women? I don't get it. And I have been writing letters and letters, especially for like the Middle East and the Arab world. Why do we keep sending men? I don't get it. So it's representation. Of course, it's resources because resources also show where our priorities are. And it's resources that help empower women and girls elsewhere to claim their sports, because usually they have the knowledge. We just need to make sure they can claim their sports to, to, to shine. And the third one is consistency. Because if I look across policy fields, even if in diplomacy, for example, we manage to have this idea of a feminist foreign policy, and then we have a migration or trade policy that, that does basically the opposite. If you look at it with a gendered lens, we are counteracting and we are diminishing the, the possibilities um, that we have to actually change something. And then the last aspect, and, and, and that's something maybe also for, for us, creatively push boundaries wherever we can. And I have taken great joy in doing that. And just a very, just a very tiny, um, very tiny episode maybe to finish with. Um, I'm the chair of the delegation to the Arabian Peninsula of the European Parliament. So um, I, I kind of represent the parliament when going there together with the other members of parliament that come. And we had planned to do a visit to Saudi Arabia and Oman. And I just sent out to all the political parties a letter saying, can you please nominate um, your candidates to join this mission? And as you want to talk about women's empowerment in Saudi Arabia, please make sure um, that I can travel with a gender balanced um, delegation. Of course, I don't have any formal rights to say that, but I, I put it in a letter. But what happened, I mean, four political groups nominated four men. And then I said, okay, I'm not going. I said, if I cannot go with a gender balance delegation, I'm just not going because I really don't think that this is the example that we want to set. And then a week later, I had my gender balance delegation and we went and it was wonderful. And before we did all the formal meetings, the women actually sat with the female parliamentarians of Saudi Arabia for half a day so that they, because they knew us, were then more vocal in the actual formal meeting where otherwise they would have remained silent. And that's also something I mean, just try to creatively push the boundaries wherever it can. And it makes a lot of joy. And the last point, because I had this long discussions with Mozan about it, is the issue of solidarity. I mean, on the one hand, we are all like very brave, proud fighters. Otherwise, we just wouldn't have made it in this field. And I, I hadn't thought of needing this solidarity for a long time. But if you really run again, one wall against the other, especially with the backlash that you see in some fields or some, some regions, and, and, and you worked so long for something and then just someone smashed it, it's, it's just wonderful to have these friends all around the world who, who send nice matches, messages or have your back, or, or you just know they would be there if you need them. So. Even if we are strong fighters, this really makes us stronger. And I, I learned to cherish that over the years. That's a very nice uh, uh, final word for the first um, input. I mean, um, I want to... I want to um, discuss one thing a little bit more that you touched upon uh, right now, Hannah. You spoke about representation and how important it is. And I absolutely agree that representation of women is one of the key aspects, but it's not enough, right? And um, I would like to know from Claire, <laughs> how do we get not only more women sitting at the table when security issues are discussed, but how do we really ensure and what can we do to ensure that gender aspects and perspectives are really discussed? and not only women sitting at the table. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and before I go into that, I just want to touch on a couple of things and one of the, the questions or comments that was also uh, put forward. And, and this relates uh, to Hannah's conversation or, or piece about solidarity. Um, the, the idea that there is an us against them in terms of the work we do as feminists, whoever, uh, whichever school of feminism you may subscribe to is one that is only going to harm us all in the end. And the idea that um, the question that civil society has about uh, holding accountable UN, EU, NATO on spending and spending and the division between militarization, and multi of course, absolutely, that is what civil society should do. But it's also important 
to be able to change the way things happen and think from the inside as well as the outside. And the idea that we need to work together to find the route to change, not only by criticizing, but finding where is that entry point. I am a feminist, but I believe in the military. And I believe that the military do excellent work. I have had my life in danger many times when the military have, have been there. And I think the idea and the question is not about um, taking money out of one thing for another. It's about how do we find the best in terms of population-centric approaches to making everybody safe and secure and to making the world a better place. And that is through many things, including protection of women and girls by our military colleagues who do great jobs in places of conflict, as well as we've seen through the delivery of supplies in COVID time. Um, and, and as crisis management, it's even more critically important. But then on the, the representation side, I am not a fan of quotas. I believe that sometimes when you put quotas on, that it becomes then an obsession with representation that becomes a cosmetic venture to finding a way forward in equality. And I say that from a defense perspective, because I have been in many situations where I've been deployed to missions where that, uh, different nations have said, uh, and this is when I was in the UN, different nations have said, look at us, we have 20% of women, but they have no authority, they have no voice, they are kept in a certain place, they're not doing the work that they're trying to do. So I think when we're talking about representation, we have to make sure we're talking about substantive and meaningful change vis-a-vis -vis representation. And, and how do we make sure that the numbers are matched by what we would call the integration. Um, increasing numbers of women is critical. It's in critical at leadership level, and I've seen change that has happened by increasing numbers of women. But more importantly, especially in an area of defense and security, we need to make sure that we're integrating gender perspectives into the work we do and not just having it on women's shoulders. And there's often a thought that if you increase women, for example, in the military, then you'll have better behaved militaries. Well, not unless you change the culture. And women, it's not their responsibility to do that. It's their responsibility to do their job. But that is a responsibility of everybody. So I'm very nervous about representation conversations that are divorced from other areas of gender equality. And if we only look at increasing numbers of women, Increasing numbers of women in a patriarchal system when the culture isn't being unpacked means we simply have numbers of women. We do not have change. We do not have meaningful progression. We have nothing but numbers. And if we just count numbers, we are doing a disservice to every woman, every man, everybody who's looking for gender equality. And so we need to get it by looking at what are the structural obstacles to gender equality. And therefore, where do meaningful numbers make sense? Yes, women in peace, uh, peace, organ, uh, peace negotiations, but they have to be women who are advancing change. And we also need more numbers of women who are feminist women who are speaking to change too. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to do better at understanding what we want from representation, making sure the voices of women are represented in all of the places and not just in something that is cosmetic or not leading to change. And that we may need to make sure that the numbers don't become a surrogate for gender equality, which on its own means more than just increasing numbers. Thank you very much. Um, Mosen, I wanted to, um, well, to ask you basically the same question that I just uh, uh, gave Claire. How can we ensure that women's perspectives and gender perspectives are included into conversations around peace and security? And um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about uh, your struggle to include um, women's rights into the constitution in, in Egypt, because that might be an, an example where it kind of worked. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think. I'm really happy of this discussion. I think it's like Hannah has been saying, solidarity is not only about the messages, but also having this kind of space for those feminists from different schools to discuss things to be better, not 
not to have it as status quo and this is also something after Pierre have been speaking about the representation and the numbers I think it's not vice versa it's not either or it is about the steps and I think it's also so important for us as feminists to see this in a critical way and also how to represent it to the people we are speaking with and I'm speaking from my positionality as a local activist who has been in not only in a patriarchal but in a dictatorship and securitized systems advocating for women's issues which is mainly people can use it and have been using it for years in order to say that we are good to women but we are bad for bad people so i do think that numbers is important because it is also giving something about the messages for the society and for also the people who are running us in patriarchal and securitized system that we know that your men are bad and we understand that if you will bring you will bring bad women to us i'm sorry i wasn't to inter interrupt you but uh, mm -hmm. the sound was not very good so maybe yes this Thank is you. better yeah yeah so i do think that it's really important to see numbers but not seeing it as goal seeing it as a process as the first step because while we are speaking about numbers it's not our fight as feminists no to only speak about numbers it's also about the quality and about gender gender perspective yes but i do think how it's really important and this is about also how from my positionality and my experience have been seeing this how investing in the feminist movement is something so important because while we are investing in this movement, those people who are the people who are carrying the process and also when we will come to this bad situation they are in and at the same time, those are the people who can give the messages and go with this society or community to the healing process. The healing which is constructive and this is also something so important about the question of women peace women peace and security from this feminist perspective that many of the people they like to have this patriarchal image about the existence of women even by numbers or by people it is about that we are nice people so we are always not violent but we are not critical thinkers. We are not activists. We are not survivors. We are not the people who have been carrying the bodies of the survival of sexual violence and rape in the hard time. So it's really important to think about numbers and about the perspectives and thinking about the movement because this is I think this is the only way to heal and to go through the process and honestly this is my experience and my movement in the region not only in Egypt that having numbers of women is important because at certain time you need allies but having feminist activists who are standing inside the process and as movement to back the people who are in and also putting those women and feminists into accountability because politics is really really a man -owned. so it's easy for us when we are existing in the process just to be this intimidated feminist that we will not speak about women all the time we are not those crazy feminists who are saying all the time where is women but honestly it is helping to have those in the movement not only pushing you but also giving you support and solidarity in your process because feminists inside the process are founding themselves alone people from the outside are always putting a 
patriarchal perspectives on them. So they are always criticizing them more than men from the same movements. And inside, people are calling you the, the crazy feminist. So I think this is so important to see the movement in this, the movement which is like, have been said, professional movement, but also the movement while people are seeing us as we are owning this fight. We are not tools. So we are the narrators. We are the actors. We are the people who are putting strategies. We are not interlocutors in your fights. It is our fight. We are owning it. And I think this is about how feminist values are important in the peace processes. Because back to these values, you can find the real people who have been suffering and have been creating the ways of surviving and thinking about the futures. Their voices and their actions are there. So it's really important to see it in this way. One of the problems I have been facing all these years in my <laughs> feminist activism that people are not seeing me and my fellow feminists as actors. They can be sympathizing with us, they can awarding us because we are different than our societies, or they can blame and shame us, but not as actors and as it is our fight. It is this is the value of the feminist movement. And this, honestly, what I'm always asking the international community to be in solidarity with us in this process. And in this perspective, being in solidarity, like it is a constructive solidarity. Constructive solidarity that our voices matter and our perspectives matter. And honestly, no one will exist and even the society will not be in a better, better situation without having us strong and can act. So within all this yani, hard processes yani, I have been facing in my life, I think this constructive solidarity is the thing which is, is the salvation for us. So it's really important for the international to have this solidarity, but not only in wartime. Be in solidarity and invest resources, and resources is not only money. It's also about spaces to give our narratives to the movement, because those are the people who will continue. Others will look at us and leave us, but we are the people who are continue to do this every day and thinking about it every single moment in our life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaking about uh, allies and solidarity, um, Numa Rusia touched upon something that now also came up in the in the Q&A. Someone wanted to know, um, Numa Rusia, what, um, how men could be allies in South Africa for your struggle and how, how um, how men can be included because as Mozen says um, it's the most of the time it's the struggle of the woman but it shouldn't only be the struggle of women to fight for equality and feminist perspectives and female and gender perspectives in in discussions around security and peace You're muted. <laughs> you need to unmute. Can maybe our tech support help, Numerusia? Vincent, can you please um, can you please um, unmute her? Oh, 
okay, we seem to. Um, no, Marisa, can you um, try again to unmute? Otherwise, I'm going to raise a question to Hannah and then we come back to you afterwards. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give a question to Hannah, which was raised in the chat as well. And then we're going to come back, back to Noma Lucia. Hannah, someone asked, um, how can EU funds be better used to support the implementation of U UN Security Council Resolution 1325? And I would, would like to add on, on this. How can it be used to um, support civil society actors um, such as uh, such as Nazra <laughs> um, to work and do the very important work they do on the ground. I would like to use two, two, two ways to answer to that. The first one is if we have, for example, negotiations with a partner country on the amount of EU funding they get and where they could spend it, um, you could do it from an economic perspective, you could do it from a perspective, how do you strengthen the government, or you could give it also gendered lens. And I have experience in the past that a lot of money goes, for example, into um, infrastructure. So you're building the big roads or you're building government buildings. But a lot less money goes into the construction of schools or of health facilities and health services. Or the many, many small roads just from the villages to the markets in the rural areas. And one kind of spending money benefits more the men in the society, where they work, where they earn their money, the, the ways they have to go. Or it could benefit more the women and the girl and lifting them up and making sure that you counterbalance a bit the discrimination that is inherent in the societies. So that is on a more general level, the question you need to ask yourself, if I spend money for this or that, because there's never enough money to do everything. The question is whom in society does it benefit? And for me, the answer would always be, it needs to make sure that it decreases the discrimination of women and girls in society and then it's a well, it's a good way to spend. The second aspect, and that's something we have been fighting for a lot also in our parliament's report is to have some money that is ring fenced for gender equality projects. There's this general number, for example, that 85% of the EU budget needs to go to projects that somehow also benefit gender equality. Well, then it's kind of a pink washing because everything benefits somehow women and girls, and then you can make your, 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 your tick box and, and it's fine. But if the primary objective of, let's say, 5% of EU funds needs to be gender equality, then there is support with money. And people need to put their brains, people in the EU delegations, for example, need to put their brains into how do we, in this context, best spend this money to improve gender equality. And then they start thinking about it and coming up with solutions and even just putting on this gender lens because they have to and they are forced to. And that is the second aspect. And um, just briefly allow me to say something on the quota because there I disagree with Claire and I just want to make the point because the discussion wouldn't be complete if I didn't. I, I see the point a bit with the military where we just have very few women and just having these numbers for women kind of overburdens the women because they have to go on all missions and they have to do all these duties so just that you can do the numbers. At least talking for politics, which is my field that I can speak about. I'm, I have become, I, I wasn't in the beginning, but I have become a big fan of the quota for two reasons. The first one is I absolutely wouldn't be where I am now if we as the Greens would not have a quota. Because I was totally fine being an advisor in the German Bundestag. I thought I made it, really. In my level of ambition and the way the way I come from, I thought that's where I can go and that's amazing. And were it not for men, looking for women that they think are good to put in that position and supporting these women. I would not have gone there because there would always have been a man who wanted to do it and I would have thought, well, that's fine if he wants to do it. Um, so there the quota helps a lot because it's not men and women competing over the same spots. And that's why men are not looking for like nice smiley women that would not harm them, but look for strong counterparts because then 
the, the couple would be better. And that's why I, I, I really think, like I said, when there is support with money and you need to find projects that fit it, forces you to think about gender equality projects, when there are spots on your list and you need to think about good women to fill them, you start doing it. And that's why it's not the end goal, but it's the first step, as Mossen said, to counterbalance the structures we have at the moment. And as long as the quota hurts, I think it has to be there. Thank you. I think we um, figured out the technical problem with Noma Wusia's uh, microphone. And now I uh, want to raise the question again, Noma Wusia. So someone asked, um, how can men be allies in South Africa? How, how, no, now you, un now you're muted again. <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to unmute you. Okay. Yes. Now, how can men be allies in South Africa? How can they help in the struggle? Uh, looking at uh, coming from the background of uh, apartheid op oppression and all this sort and uh, coming from the conflict and the violence which was taking place, especially the harm which was done by all uh, stakeholders or, and then the, the officials like from the soldiers, uh, police and uh, all, all that, uh, all, all this we said that we will really have to be open. We don't we need not to hide uh, the intercesses done by men. We need to have a, an open discussion and uh, with the strong women to be able to, to tell the stories, to show the scars and to bring men into the uh, discussions in order also they can come up and also voice out and be able to give a really think think well and a reasoning of what is that in their mind there must be no separate issue of uh, women discussions alone and uh, men's discussions alone. We need to bring this uh, society with the understanding of uh, bringing a peace and a change to transform the this uh, dynamic of men being like thinking that they can be uh, over both the, the women. And um, we are talking about this, as we said, that we created these platforms because we have seen now in South Africa, uh, during the time of democracy, this, uh, when we say we liberated, uh, we faced a lot of uh, gender violence, uh, gender abuse, especially on women and children, as if the men's society are not part and parcel of the women and the children, girls' children. That's why we said that they need to be uh, brought into uh, this agenda and to be part of the, the discussions and to get and understand we need to expose, uh, to expose what is happening, what is that they are doing. And this thing needs to be also like uh, be broadcasted all over we need when the incidents of a uh, sexual harassment rape and uh, the abusive and this harassment which are, are done to women needed to be something which is supposed to be seen and looked at it not something to say i we must hide we cannot look in order can bring change thank you Unfortunately, we are already coming a little bit to the end of uh, this event, but I have one last question that I would like all of you to answer. Um, even though Claire said she refuses to celebrate, um, we want to kind of celebrate the 20th anniversary of this resolution, but um, it's not the resolution who can make birthday wishes, it's you who can make birthday wishes for the resolution. So I would like um, to give every one of you maybe one minute to say what she wishes for the 20th anniversary. And I would like to start um, with Hannah, and then Mosen, and then Numa Rusia, and then Claire. 
I, I wish this resolution a happy 20th anniversary. I think it has grown a lot and it has helped us grow a lot. Um, but I hope that 20 years from now, maybe we don't have, even have to celebrate it or think about it anymore because it's totally normal. Um, and it doesn't need this reference anymore for everybody to talk about. It. Thank you. I think seeing our movement in our region is recognized and being in the process is my wish to happen and leave us on our struggle. Thank you. Numa Rusia, what is, what is your wish? You're muted. You're muted again, Numa Rusia. It's the running joke. Now, now it's fine. All right, thank you. Uh, what I would like to say uh, uh, in this event, in this anniversary of 1325 uh, UN resolution, is to say uh, it's too far. Uh, we need to now start to be more committed and to be active and to make sure that we may uh, we make all these countries which are part and parcel of this uh, resolution uh, to have a binding agreement which will make them to be able to bring a good action plan uh, which is going to involve all people in the society. And I would like just to say to end, uh, I'm more than mm, happy to inform you that as I am here, we are already in the struggle to, on, on Wednesday, we are going to sleep in parliament as a, a national Kuluman support group to make sure that we force uh, our leaders, government, to look at the unfinished business, especially that clause of a gender uh, issue, rape and sexual harassment, which happened during the apartheid, which is now uh, the basis of what is happening now, because if it was unattended, we are going to sleep there in and force the, our government to do something to bring us reparation and also to do the social economy because this is are the basic issues which makes uh, this uh, gender uh, to escalate in all different countries, not to close the issue of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claire. I unmute. Thank you. I want to say a happy birthday to a Libra, uh, uh, Gnosis Scorpio, uh, 1325. And I want to say you've come a long way, baby. Uh, great, great strides, but we need to be bolder. And I think as, as you grow into your next, uh, your next phase of maturity, uh, to have more implementation, and I will say, less well-written action plans and more well-intentioned words, but let's put action, let's put our feet to the pedal, pedal and let's move this on. Um, what we also don't need is another resolution. Um, and I think we need to implement what we have. We need to be strong, we need to be bold, we need more feminists, and we need to work together um, a little bit better so that we can see the next 20 years Maybe we don't have to talk about women, peace and security because it's just going to be part of our DNA. Thank you very much. That was a very nice final sentence. I have to say all, all of you had very nice final uh, sentences and wishes. And now I want to thank you again for um, discussing this afternoon with me. It was a great pleasure. It was a great honor to, to have you as my distinguished first all-female panel, by the way. Um, 
I also want to thank uh, our participants that are still here. It's still over 120 people that are listening to us. Uh, so this is a very good turnout. I want to thank my colleagues in the background who helped with the Q&A and also with the event and our technical support and the interpreters. You, you see, it's a great group of people that are needed for such an event. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think I... I just want to say that um, I absolutely agree. I think we need more solidarity. We need more working together. And um, but I think that this is a very good. This event was a very um, uprising uh, thing for me. I'm very motivated, and I hope you feel motivated as well. Um, and. If you need even more inspiration, check our web dossier. You can also read a portrait of Norma Russia and a portrait of Mosen in this uh, dossier. And um, now I just want to wish you all a very lovely afternoon. Um, stay safe in these very strange times and uh, hope to see you all uh, sometime soon again and then in person. <laughs>